Well, let's open with prayer. Father, I just thank you for this day. I thank you for each person that's here. I thank you for those that you are yet bringing. Lord, we prayed this morning, we asked you, Father, to bring them from the east, the west, the north, and the south into this place, Father, that they can meet you, that there can be salvation. So, Father, we give you all the glory. We thank you, Lord. This is your work, not ours. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Wow. The message this morning, I never, I never tell, uh, I never tell Ruby beforehand what the message is. She prays about it, and she and Craig pray about it, determine what the songs are going to be. So I'm always, I'm always looking forward to see what songs the Lord has put on her mind. And the songs this morning I thought were just perfect. Yeah. Uh, I entitled this BYOA. BYOA. You all know what BYOB is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you all answered honestly. Bring your own Bible. You Thank go. you. Yes. Bring your own Bible. We've got a message of that too. This is BYOA. It means bring your own atmosphere. So whatever the atmosphere is that you walk in, whether it's negative, positive, anticipatory, uh, excited about what God is going to do, that's an atmosphere you bring with you. But if you bring a down atmosphere and everything is bad, I've been looking at all those circumstances, that's a different atmosphere. Right. And when you come anywhere with that atmosphere, it kind of puts a damper on everything. Amen? Amen. So bring your own atmosphere. Or, I had, I had trouble with titles on this. Or, the casting of a man. You know what it means, cast seed, right? Yeah. If a man is walking and casting seed in the field. But we're going to talk about the casting of a man. We've talked often about how if you know that God brought you here, into this place, at this time, then God cast you here, is what I'm saying. So, bring your own atmosphere. Every Christian individually brings an atmos atmosphere when you're searching for the truth. If it's a negative atmosphere, you're going to have trouble finding the truth here. Or you're going to find all the wrong things and call those the truth. But if you bring an atmosphere of expectancy, you know that God is going to do something. God is doing something. Even when you can't see anything happening, God is working. Sometimes that's his greatest work being done. Sometimes in the silence when it looks like nothing, nothing is happening that I, the way I wanted it to happen is when God sometimes is doing his greatest work. That's right. So we need to always be looking to see what God is doing for some. The atmosphere becomes an un unapproachable barrier that no teacher's word could even begin to penetrate. You know what I'm doing, saying? It's like building a wall around yourself where the word can't even penetrate. Now we know God's word can penetrate any place he, he puts it in, but if you've made up your mind you're not going to hear, then maybe you won't hear. That's right. That's right. So, thank God. The opposite can also be true. Right. Um, Some can bring such openness and expectancy that even the worst message, the poorest presentation, sets you aflame. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? That's hopeful. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's hopeful for all of us. So Matthew 13 is kind of what we're going to be talking about today. Is not a collection that was arranged by inspired writers. It's, a, it's what God put together. It's what Jesus Christ ordered. The seven or eight parables in this set discourse of Jesus are arranged in his order, the order he wanted them in. And there's a reason for that. Not according to some random selection. Somebody didn't go through when they were putting this all in order. And, well, let's put this teaching in here. Let's put this teaching of Jesus in here. And uh, because these are parables, let's put all these parables together. That ought to make us sit up and take notice. If God, if Jesus put them together, then we better take notice Amen. of what is being said. 
Jesus himself, I believe, arranged this teaching because it has a purpose. But an unreceptive attitude can make even such a pinnacle of truth a point of death to our own grasp of the truth. Our minds already <laughs> sorry. <laughs> our I couldn't I couldn't avoid commenting. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> our minds, okay. Our, but don't go to sleep. No, I'm, not. <laughs> I'm taking notes. Our minds can be so prejudiced against the messenger mm -hmm. that we can't hear what the messenger is saying. That's that happens. Point. Our minds or perhaps by our own preconceptions of the truth that we they won't change our mind by what the messenger says. Because we're set already, we've already made up our mind what this means. Don't tell me it means something different. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Around each of us is an atmosphere that we bring forward to wherever we are. It is more often the explanation for the end results that are produced in our lives than what is said or is written is the atmosphere that we bring. Now believe me on this point, I've often demonstrated the sad truth of being unable to receive because of my own self-erected barriers. Perhaps I've judged the messenger. Then we're in trouble, right? Perhaps it's not the right timing for me to hear this. I'm just not in the mood to hear this today. Uh, in Matthew, the chapter previous to Matthew 13, which would be, of course, Matthew 12, there was a gathering storm happening in, in Matthew 12. Everything was going wrong. A storm of criticism and hatred had been gathering around Jesus ever since he had sent the twelve to witness to the gospel of the kingdom. When he sent them out, according to those who were watching, they did everything wrong. And so the storm was building against Jesus. In Matthew 10, he sent out the twelve to minister to the kingdom of God. And the storm was building. Matthew 12, 7. Matthew 12, 7. When Jesus, hung, Jesus' hungry disciples handpicked grain on the Sabbath, the Pharisees saw their deed and judged them. Right? Jesus rebuked them, the Pharisees. In 12, 10, then he, headed, then he healed the man with the withered hand on the Sabbath. He didn't do anything according to the rules of the religious people. And here in this church, we don't do very much according to the religious people. Can anybody say amen, amen. to that? The Pharisees challenged him again, and they counseled together to destroy him. In Matthew 12, 13 and 15 through 15, many followed him when he left, and he healed them all. Matthew, I'm going to turn there. Matthew 12. Matthew 12, 13 through 15. Hold on. Matthew 12, 13 through 15. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and it was restored to normal like the other. But the Pharisees went out and counseled together against him as to how they might destroy him. But Jesus, aware of this, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all on the Sabbath. He wasn't supposed to do that. And then his family started questioning him. I mean, how many of you have had your family question what you're doing? Right. Yeah, some of you could raise four hands. Right? Where they said, what are you doing? Why are you doing Are you Are you crazy? Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9. Matthew 13, verses 1 through 9. Which I'm going to read. On that day, 13, 1. On that day, you know, don't you find some of the times, sometimes the way they put things, it's interesting. On that day. What day? That day. On that day. 
Because in God's eyes, it was a perfect day. It was the right day. It was the right time. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. And great multitudes gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat down, and the whole multitude was standing on the beach. When I go to Israel, often we've gone there and taught there at that very place. It's, it's just, it's so wonderful to stand right there where, you, where what you read in the Bible happened. And imagine that you're there that day, and Jesus is just pushed out a couple feet from shore, and he's sitting in the boat, and he's teaching. He got into a boat, he sat down, and the whole multitude was standing on the beach. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up. And others fell upon the rocky places where they did not have much soil, and immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked, choked them out. And the others fell on this good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty and some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Amen. Jesus went out in the city by the sea in a boat. You know, Jesus really, understand how I'm going to say this, isn't that much different than us. You know, have you ever noticed that sometimes you just have to get away? Sometimes you just have to get, separate yourself from whatever's going on and you just have to get away to a quiet place where you can hear. All of us have come into that those times. Sometimes you just need to get away. We need to step back. We need to reflect on what is happening. We need to review what is happening so that we can... Lord, what am I to do in this so that we can get refreshed? And great multitudes gathered to him so that he got into a boat and sat down and the whole multitude was standing on the beach. Was this an interruption of what Jesus was going to do? I don't think so. This was a planned event, planned, divinely orchestrated by our Lord. Could Jesus find no moment to himself? even in the midst of these most recent depressing developments of everybody attacking him? Or was it destiny? destiny. Was it exactly what was supposed to be happening? That's right. Or an encouraging prophetic look at the future, acceptance and an ultimate response from the people that he can reach, that he came to reach. So was it a prophetic look ahead of what was going to happen? No matter how Jesus felt about the people's present that day, his response came from the heart of a true teacher. And he spoke many things in verse 3 to them in parables saying, and he went on. Jesus speaks out of the intimacy of the situation. There was indeed a gathering storm on the horizon. Mm -hmm. I think we can see a gathering storm yes. on the horizon that we look into. Jesus had seen his disciples growing confusion within the house before he left to stroll down to the sea. He knew that he needed to reassure them that although their labor might seem wasted, they could look forward to future abundant harvest. Right, amen. Hello. That's right. Even though what we are doing right. may seem useless, right. the Lord is promising a future harvest an abundant harvest. Jesus needed his disciples to understand the true principles of kingdom methodology and success. Is God trying to get us to understand the true methodology of the kingdom of building? I believe so. Do we think we understand it all? No. If we think we understand it all, we probably better rethink that. That's right. There's so much there's so much depth that we don't understand that we can't figure out. They seem so obviously in conflict with the recent barrage of opposing human thought and program. What do you do when everybody's opposing you? What do you do when everybody's saying you must be nuts? What do you do? Stand faithful. Stand. That's right. Present rejection would be met by a future promise of victory. Mm -hmm. 
there were imperative lessons to be learned along the way. A right way to assure a harvest. There's a right way and there's a wrong way. We want to be the right way. <coughs> a true understanding of the necessary attitude of kingdom success. The potential of the parables. Although I believe that Matthew 13 is a single discourse taught by Jesus in one specific setting that we've just talked about. Mm -hmm. The chapter is interspersed with important commentary as well. And it, it, for example, after Jesus finishes presenting the first four parables to the multitude, he begins his trek toward, the ho toward a house where he can teach his disciples exclusively. In Matthew 13, 34 through 36. Matthew 13, 34 through 36. <coughs> oh, I hope I got the right page. All these things Jesus spoke to the multitudes in parables, and he did not speak to them without a parable, so that what was spoken to the promise, put through the prophet, might be fulfilled, saying, I will open my mouth in parables, I will utter things hidden since the foundation of the world. Then he left the multitudes and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered them, The one who sows the good seed is who? The Son And the field is, the, is what? The world. the world. And as for the good seed, these are the sons of what? The kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them, and what did the devil sow? The tares, the evil ones. And the harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Hmm. Interesting. Luke records the same story in a context similar to Matthew's account yet with several dissimilarities, including an emphasis that is clearly different. Luke's content, context is not about the kingdom at all, but rather about the provision and care of Jesus' physical needs by a group of wealthy women drawing from their own substance. Only Matthew sees this particular parable as fundamental to a specifically arranged discourse of Jesus on the nature and principles of the kingdom of God. But Jesus himself set this discourse, which is our theme. It is possible for the Christian to know God's program and both willfully and intelligently cooperate with that purpose for the Church of Jesus Christ in this age. Matthew 13 is not a collection of truths taken from the Savior's collection of truths, taken from his teaching at different times and then brought together. He himself set this discourse. In the case of the two foundational parables, he himself interpreted their meaning as well. Matthew 13 stands as a unique and irreplaceable category. And I'm going to tell you something you probably don't know. Things are not always what they seem. <laughs> That's for sure. Amen. You probably <laughs> discovered that in life, haven't you? <laughs> Consider the current warnings on automobile mirrors that say, objects may be closer than they appear. Yikes. Maybe God's ultimate purpose has eluded us. Is that possible? So let me tell you a little story. I heard this story a long time ago about a white-haired senior woman. I'm a senior, but not white-haired. And this is my color. It's not dyed. <laughs> I'm the one who wants white hair, like my, my sister back there. I wanted white hair, always wanted white hair, because it means, it means intelligence. Wisdom. Wisdom. <laughs> Mine is still dark, with a few gray streaks in it. I once heard about a white-haired senior woman, woman who, after shopping, came out to discover four young white males about to drive off in her car. She dropped her shopping bags, pulled a handgun from her purse and shouted, I have a handgun and I know how to use it. Get out of my car, you scumbags. I like this lady. <laughs> Terrified, the four young men leapt simultaneously out of her car, fled the parking lot, 
Badly shaken by her experience, the older lady then loaded her groceries into the car and prepared to drive away. She was so shaken, however, that she couldn't get the key to work in the ignition. She tried and tried, but to no avail, and finally she spotted the problem. Her own car parked about two doors away. <laughs> After quickly transferring her groceries to her car, the woman promptly drove to the police station. The policeman to whom she told the story practically collapsed with laughter as he directed the lady's attention to the end of the counter. There stood four very pale young men in the process of reporting a carjacking by an older lady about five feet tall with white curly hair and carrying a very large handgun. <laughs> so things don't always look. So what's the lesson to be learned? Things do not always appear as they actually are. That's right. We need to know God's actual program for the Church of Jesus Christ in this era. Then we must be prepared to willfully and intelligently cooperate with that purpose. Matthew 13, verses 3 through 9. Matthew 13, verses 3 through 9. And he spoke many things. To them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate them up, and others fell upon the rocky places where they did not have much soil. And immediately they sprang up because they had no depth of soil. But when the sun had risen, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And others fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them out. And others fell on the good soil and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Mm -hmm. So our common understanding is that the seed is the word of God. Amen. The response concerns all the various types of soil that interact to produce success or failure. This interpretation fits conveniently into our prevailing Christian emphasis. We do our job sowing the word, generally and personally, and it's stony soil or rock that makes the seed we sow in ineffective. Certainly, no blame can be placed on us for that, right? We have no choice of that. But Jesus upsets the apple cart in his explanation of the second parable, tares among the wheat, in Matthew 13, 24 through 30. We'll go to that. 24 through 30. There we go. <laughs> he presented another parable to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed tares also among the wheat and went away. And when the wheat sprang up more grain, then the tares became evident also. And the slaves of the landowner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? And he said to them, An enemy has done this. And the slaves said to him, Do you, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you are gathering up the tares, you may root up the wheat with them. Allow both to grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather up the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. So if the field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. So what's the conclusion to this matter? Quite simple. The seed is not the word cast into the heart of a man, but it is the casting of a man into a certain age and generation. Yeah. It is the sowing, not of truth, but of a man or a woman. Can this be? If so, it turns everything we knew about kingdom purpose on its head. Mm -hmm. Is the kingdom purpose to plant the word, scattering the seed here and there so that it sporadically bears fruit, depending on soil or conditions? Or does God grant and plant people? We've said in the past, you didn't decide to come here, God brought you here. Here into this area, into this church, into the Walker area. So God then must plant people. 
Does he carefully scatter prepared sons and daughters of the kingdom throughout the world in every age at the fulfillment for the fulfillment of his purpose? Does he bring you where he wants you to be for his purpose? Yes. I am forever grateful to the Father that he didn't send a track or write a book, however beautiful, but God sent his son. Amen. God sent a man. God sent a man to speak. We call that incarnation the truth in flesh, the message in the man, the Christ man. So the real point seems clear. The seed sown in his heart and the man sown by the wayside are identified. The seed in the heart is not of itself responsible, but the man who lets the devil snatch it away is responsible. Here is the radical statement of God's purpose. A radically different concept of how the kingdom of God strategizes its influence. Disciples, people. When the world bumps into a true kingdom representative, they run headlong into God. Do you hear what I'm saying? Thank you, Lord. What effect are we producing on the age we live in? We are the ones who have been planted. We are the ones who have been sown and others like us. He has raised us up for the purpose of his kingdom. What effect in my, is my life producing in the kingdom of God? Ask yourself that question. What effect is my life doing in the kingdom of God? Or am I so involved in what I'm doing, what I want to do, where I want to go, what I want to be, that I'm not doing anything regarding the kingdom of God? Because I'm all wrapped up in me. Are you with me? Do you understand? As we develop this discourse, there is one sower, Jesus Christ himself, one kind of seed, the men and women of the kingdom of God. That's the seed that God is casting. One kind of soil. It's the current age. That's the soil that God has cast us into. It's the current age, everything that's going on around us that seems to be so terrible. It's all a part of what the world is doing but four totally different results to the sowing, depending on the nature of the response that kingdom folk have when confronted with their present day kingdom challenges. There must be godly influence produced by kingdom men and women in a godless age. So, how is that different then? We have Jesus Christ within us. God casts us into this place or a time and a, and a place and a location to do his purpose. So the conclusion today, our Heavenly Father is a very good steward and a wonderful farmer. When he desired to impact the age of man, he didn't send a trap, instead he sent his son. Born of flesh, made like man in every way, the Father in incarnated the hidden truth of eternal purpose in the person and personality of his son, Jesus Christ. Then the Son, by his faithful and sacrificial obedience, revealed the purpose of the Father to mankind in just the same way. As steward of the Father's world, so is into every age, sons and daughters of the kingdom. John 20, 21. Jesus therefore said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. We are sent ones. How have we impacted the place we've been sent to? We are meant, as Jesus was, to influence and alter the direction of the current age through our godly lives, our God-given gifts, our compassion, concern. We're meant to be world changers. Let me say that again. We're meant to be world changers. What are we doing? Influencing every arena of life in the era of our generation. So thoughts to ponder. If I am the seed that has been sown, what is the soil of my own heart? A question for each of us to ask. Is it rocky? Is the atmosphere of my heart receptive? 
Is there so much worry in today's troubles and cares that I don't have time? That I'm too involved in my own stuff to be concerned about why God has sold me and the place he has sold me? To be not concerned about the people that are lost? The people that out there, there are people suffering, there are people crying, there are people wanting to give up, there are people weeping, there are people lost. Do I really understand kingdom business? If I am where God has sown me, am I making an impact of any kind at all? So just the seed principle, let's look at it. Single grain of wheat, a single grain of wheat produces a head, which contains 30 to 100 grains or seed. Some single, some singles produce 30 seeds, others produce 60, some produce 100 new grains. But the principle is growth and expansion of the kingdom. Lord, is there anything between you and me? Show me. Set things right. Yeah. Before I come to you, to you, let me begin anew today as your son and or daughter sown into this time, into this place. Open my heart to your word and touch me. Ooh. That's a question for each of us to ponder in our own hearts. What impact am I making on God's kingdom in the world? Bringing people into God's kingdom. Bringing people into life, true life. Not losses, and pain, and misery. Many of in our own families are struggling. Many friends that we know are struggling. Someone just contacted me a couple, few days ago about a grandson that had committed suicide. And everybody was shocked because nobody knew that was a problem. What if we talk to somebody tomorrow about Christ and we pray for them and it's somebody who's contemplating suicide. It's somebody who's contemplating a divorce or a separation or whatever but they're suffering and they think they're suffering alone. Ask the Lord when you go out in the world, show me, Lord, who you want me to pray for. Show me who you want me to touch. Show me who you want to touch, Lord. And it's amazing what he will do. He will show you. He will show you. And he will give you words. So Father, we just give this time to you and pray. Most of all, that you are glorified. Show us, Lord, in this next week that there might be testimonies next Sunday as to those that you have met in the world, those that you have prayed for in the world, those that you have led to Jesus Christ in this next week. Let us see what we can do to bring the kingdom of heaven to those who do not know Jesus Christ. God bless you. Let's close in worship.